All right. Shall we roll into it? Let's start the show. We've got so much to talk about. Um, yeah. I figured that we could organize this in terms of how you work with Origin start to bottom, how you do a project. And that would start with taping. Yep. Workspace setup. Exactly. So we've heard a lot of things about taping. Um, some true, some false. We've got a tape board here set up um, that we've started to apply tape to. And the very foundation of taping, it might seem even too simple, but how do you apply tape <laughs> in the best way to this work surface? Because there is a right and a wrong way to do it. That is true. Yeah. Uh, well, start off, make sure your work surface is clean, dust free. Because um, I'd say one of the most important things of shaper tape is once you stick it down, you don't want it to move. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to risk those edges to peel up or anything like that because mm -hmm. once you've scanned it in, that's where you're going to get a little error code saying, hey, I've seen tape movement. Mm -hmm. And then at that point, you can't just stick it down. You should remove that whole strip. Yep. Um, but now they've got a clean work surface, mm -hmm. actually rolling it out. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have specially formulated this tape to be the perfect amount of stickiness so that it sticks where you want it to, but it removes as soon as you're done with your project. And to apply that, we're going to start just by tacking one side down to the board, stretching the tape. I shouldn't even say stretching. I should just say unrolling the tape with as little tension on it as possible, keeping the tape straight and off of the work surface, and then tack it all down in one go. Beautiful. Now, why is it important to not stretch the tape? Well, because it's an incredibly highly precise thing. Yeah. It's printed to a very, very tight tolerance. Mm -hmm. So we don't want to distort it in any way. So if you're going over a long area, you don't want to pull too much tension because even just a little bit, mm -hmm. you're not getting that highest level of accuracy. You want it to be as is, as mm -hmm. intended. Um, and then the same thing goes for how you lay it down. Mm -hmm. I've seen a lot of people, over, over especially over long distances, because it just kind of makes sense, um, they run with it. So mm, they're mm -hmm. kind of unrolling it and pressing it down at the same time. Mm -hmm. And if you want to show what that kind of looks like. Yeah. This is the wrong way, so don't do this. We're going to... It's actually so unnatural to me. I might not even be able to do it. So is this what you're talking about, That's Jake? That's exactly what I'm talking about. And what I'm guessing this is doing is introducing that stretch and then baking it in it's as not I go across. Yeah, it's a little bit of stretch. It's actually curved because it's if you look mm. if you sight down that piece of tape now, mm -hmm. it is curving. Interesting. So that if when you pull it out straight, you're actually maintaining a straight line. Mm -hmm. And it's not so much that individual dominoes can't be turned, but it's the whole arc. Mm -hmm. That kind of throws a little bit of weirdness into it. So again, mm -hmm. this whole session is going to be about best practices. Mm -hmm. A lot of these things you can get away with, but that's not why we're here. We're here to get the best possible accuracy. Yeah, exactly. Um, and use this tool for what it's made for. Yeah. Um, and this is, uh, we're going to go try and uh, dive into the descriptions of not just how to do things, but why it all works Yeah. the way that it does. Um, Origin is a tool with a brain inside it uh, and it's not just a thing that you use like a hammer or like a handsaw um, it's more something that i think you work with and mm -hmm. if you understand the brain and how it works then it can really help you work with the tool even yeah. better for the best results so we've applied our tape to the work surface um, you might notice that all of my tape rows are going the same direction mm -hmm. but we get the question a lot of what happens if rather than making all of my rows of tape parallel, what if I make a couple of perpendicular rows of tape? Or, for example, tape down the edge. So if I want to make sure that I get a nice, clean, visual image of the edge of my board, I might do something like this. Now what do we say about this one, Jake? That one feels fine to me. Although this is killing me. we got to take that one off. Which one? This one? This yeah. little chip right here? No, no, no. This whole strip. Oh, so because it's curved. It's got the curve. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, so does the camera care what direction the tape goes? No. We've talked In with, short. Yeah. We've talked with our algorithm designers here at Shaper. We're not the algorithm designers uh, personally. We're the talent. We're the on-screen talent. <laughs> but we've talked with all the right people. Yes. And the consensus is 
that if you want to tape uh, in the direction opposite to what we normally do on the show or what we normally do with Workstation, the way that the, the tape sheet is pre-applied to that, it's A-OK. -okay. And you actually have an example. I yeah. saw you set up an example earlier of why you might want to do that. Yeah, typically when, I'm, when I am working, I'm putting my tape out perpendicular to me because it gives Origin a really good vantage point over each domino because it's looking mm -hmm. at it this way versus sighting down it. Um, but it's totally okay to sight down it in the sense of this. I'm working on a piece of hardwood. I don't have room to face this way, this direction, and put it that way. And I'm not going to necessarily take all the time to put strips this way. Mm -hmm. So it's totally okay to run tape the length of the board. And if I'm just putting an element down here at the end, be able to sit and sight down the board. That is just fine. And as a little bit of a workflow, I find myself, if I'm making something out of hardwood, um, I will mill my material and just leave it a little long. Mm -hmm. That way I have area to look out at and mm -hmm. have extra space for tape. And it leaves some freshly milled material for the next person that's going to yeah. walk up and, in, yeah. in our case, in a shared shop. There you go. Make a little trinket out of it. Yeah. Um, one thing that you might notice between this tape board that we've been working with and that piece of hardwood that Jake just pulled out, they're both about the same size. They're about three feet long. And one of the things that we love about Origin is that you can use it in an infinitely large workspace. You can use it on the floor of your house. Uh, hardwood flooring is a great application for us. Countertops, kitchen countertops, um, tables, inlays and tables, really big stuff. But what we do recommend there to make sure that you aren't overexerting yourself and stretching the tape too much is to just lay out pieces of three feet at a time. And when you scan, which we're about to get into next, Origin's scanning algorithm is going to composite all of those pieces of tape, separate pieces of tape, into one image. Uh, it's going to bake it all together, you could say. And whether you have a three foot long section or a six foot long section doesn't really matter to the algorithm as long as you've applied it correctly and it's more likely that you're going to apply it correctly if you work with a manageable distance yeah. like three feet or so yeah kind of your arms width mm -hmm. a natural arms width, natural not arms like width. a not like a how far can you stretch yeah exactly. arms width we do an exercise before the show where we uh we squeeze down like a lemon, and then we stretch out as far as we can go to get nice and comfortable on set. Uh, and not that arm's width, just a nice, comfortable arm's width. Yeah. You know? Um, to be note, uh, just to note it as well, all of this information can be found on our website on the support page, and I believe Ted is going to share that in the comments section. Mm -hmm. So if it escapes you and you need to just read about it a little bit more, you can find it on the support page, mm -hmm. uh, how to tape. Distance, quick note on distance. Mm -hmm. I always say four inches on center. The mm -hmm. website says three inches in between, so that's roughly mm -hmm. the same. Mm -hmm. um, but that will shift mm -hmm. depending on what you're working on and the project, the size of it. Um, but that is the recommended ratio, about mm -hmm. four inches on center. If mm -hmm. I'm doing a short, a small piece where I don't have a whole lot of room for tape, I might put a couple of layers down, a couple extra rows down. Mm -hmm. in a tighter space just so I have more dominoes to reference. Mm -hmm. um, and same thing as you go really large, you might realize I don't want to cover an entire sheet of plywood in mm -hmm. tape. But just realize as you start getting away from that uh, four inch on center mark, you st your accuracy starts to degrade a little bit over time mm -hmm. or over yeah. space. Yeah, and we like that three to four inches on center for sheet goods or large operations because that's the approximate density of dominoes that you want to see in the total camera field of view mm -hmm. when it has a full unobstructed field of view, which you can see on the scanning screen that we're about to go to next. Um, when you don't have that full field of view, when you're working on something smaller, you might want those dominoes to be more dense. But if you have a full four by eight sheet of dense dominoes, you are adding a lot of dominoes that don't really add to the precision of the tool. So what we're talking about here is the balance between using too much tape, um, gumming up even the processing works of the machine just by giving it way too much information um, without really getting any benefit at all. Uh, the maximum benefit to tape ratio that we found is on that three to four inch mark. And if you do more than that, you're not really getting yourself anything. 
That's tape. That's tape. I was <laughs> trying to think of anything else that we didn't cover about tape. Um, you know what they can do. What? You know what the people can do. Ask us questions. Yeah, in ask the questions comments. about tape. So if there's anything that you want to know about tape that we haven't covered in Jake and Russ's pro tips on tape, this is everything that we thought of over the last week or so that we wanted to share with you, please ask it in the comments, and we'll get to it in the Q&A. And don't forget to answer that giveaway question, that poll question that pops up on the bottom of your screen. I think it's, uh, what session do you want to see next? Yeah. Because we're really aiming to please on this yeah. episode. We're doing all your <laughs> questions, and we're asking you what you want to see next. So sock it to us. Let us know, and we'll get to it. One last quick note on tape. It is a one-time use thing. That adhesive is kind of at perfect balance between it won't damage a piece uh, mm -hmm. and you know is just sticky enough. Mm -hmm. So it is a one-time use thing. I don't try to peel a tape, a piece of tape up, and place it back down because mm -hmm. that has lost some of its tackiness, mm -hmm. and you risk it starting to peel up during mm -hmm. your work and that's the last thing you want yeah you get those tape movement errors or just something that you don't want to happen yeah happen. and if that does happen and you or a piece does start to peel up just go ahead and remove it place down a new piece and add the scan which we will cover in scanning right now this is where we add the youtube chapter so that <laughs> exactly. it's easily and referenceable in the future scanning this is scanning i'm gonna hand this to you all right beautiful so naturally we've gotten a lot of questions on scanning What's the best way to do it um, for greatest accuracy um, without maybe bogging down the machine? Yep. Because a large scan can, uh, again, kind of like adding a lot of dominoes, can become onerous at, at a point. So if we go to the, to the scan, to the origin cam here, I'm going to add a new scan, start scan. And you can see now that it's viewing my workspace. And the way that we typically scan on the show is to go across, down, across, down, across, down. Now there's two different ways uh, to do that. Let's actually go back to the conversational view here because I have something that I want to ask you, Jake. Okay. We talked with our algorithm designer, Alec, um, and it turns out that there are two different ways of doing that lawnmower method, basically, that I just described, where you go over and down and back and down and over again. And one of those ways was better than the other. Right. right. One was, uh, well, there's a crucial element to the lawnmower technique right. that without it, is use uh, the technique is useless. Right. And that is overlap. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. And he put it uh, in a really nice way. When you're overlap, it's not quite lawn mowing because, you know, that's a very small amount of overlap. You're just trying to, like, skim along path that mm -hmm. path he did last time we want serious overlap in the sense of multiple images of the same row to create what alec called a mesh mm -hmm. how yeah. would you explain that yeah a mesh exactly um so for example if uh if you have uh, a row of tape up here and a row of tape down here you start in this corner go all the way across and then only tie that top row of tape to that bottom row of tape over here on the side before you go back across this domino over here at the start and this domino over here at the end are basically unconnected. It's like one long string. And any error that's present, maybe from stretching the tape or, for example, your angle's not being quite right, maybe you've got a curve in your tape, those are going to compound over the length of that unconnected string. Whereas if you have a lot of overlap and a nice interlocked mesh, what you're going to get is every domino attached to each other in all of these different images. Exactly. So, Creates a strong foundation for the whole workspace to be built mm -hmm. off of. So we're going to show you scanning the way that we typically do it here. Um, we should probably show an example of the wrong way also sure. while we're at it. Uh, and then we'll show you the absolute ultimate scanning technique, which takes a little bit more time, mm -hmm. but will ensure that you get really good overlap in all directions. All right. So let's do, let's do our classic way first. I'm going to start again. Let's cancel this. I'm going to start a new scan up here in the corner. So I'm over here in the corner of my workpiece. My classic scanning technique is to go all the way across. And you can see Origin is taking a bunch of pictures as I go. That's all those still frames. And now I just go, I have two rows of tape previously scanned that are visible. And I'm going to add one row at a time. Yeah, you're scooting Origin back. I don't know, roughly four inches per pass. Yeah, four inches or so. Making sure that I've got a lot of overlap as I go. And that's the end. 
I'm going to finish that and it's going to composite this or bake it, if you will, into one image. One note that we learned from Alec is that it's impossible to overscan. Yeah, you can just keep going over it if you really wanted to. As many times as you want. It'll take a little bit longer to compute that final image, but once that final image is made, it's no more processor intensive or no more uh, drive space intensive than an image with fewer uh, photos or less overlap. Mm -hmm. So you may as well really take your time and get as much overlap as you need. So now you can see I'm back in my scan and I've got that one nice big composited image. All right, now let's do a let's do a bad lawnmower scan. I'm going to do a new scan. I'm going to start up here in this corner again. All right, and I just want to see one row. I'm going to like do the worst thing possible. So I'm just scanning one row here. And now coming I'm, way I'm down. I'm tying it down. I'm bringing it down. And now I'm on these next three rows here. But you can see that as I go across, they're actually not connected to my first row at all, except at the end. And now I can go back all the way down. And these two last rows are not connected to the three rows above it. So I've got three disconnected rows here. And while this is, in theory, a valid scan, it's not a mesh. It's like a long string or a long yep. springy line. Um, that is going to give you a reasonable cut, but we're here for the best accuracy we're possible. Here for the best. So I'm not even going to calculate that one. I'm going to cancel it. Now, la pièce de la résistance. Uh, yeah, it, this one's if you have all the time in the world. All the time in the world. What do we call it, Jake? We call it the waffle scan. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go across. I'm going to make sure that I've got all of this overlap in all in every pass good amount of overlap i think this is my last pass if i bop it down yep we've got no more rows left now to make sure that i'm tied together vertically as well as possible also i'm going to do the same thing making passes in the vertical dimension There we go. Now that is what I call a scan. And like we said, there's no such thing as over scanning. So it's going to take uh, maybe an extra couple of seconds to calculate this. But if you really want the ultimate in precision, the waffle scan is the way to go. Yeah. But regardless, as long as you have good overlap, you're going to be OK. And you're going to make a good mesh there. Personally, there are very few times that I've, uh, that I've waffle scanned. Yeah. In, I mean, in my daily use of Origin. We don't do it on the show. You're making a, a beautiful high-precision chair, and you cut out all the pieces without waffle scanning. Yeah. Uh, see more about that on Instagram Live. Check out our Instagram to see the chair that Jake is building this month. It's wild. <laughs> uh, some huge mortise and tendons. Great, great stuff. There's going to be some Danish cord weaving content. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> hours oh, yeah. and hours, <laughs> hours of and hours Danish of cord weaving, weaving content. Um, but that was all cut out in our uh, high overlap lawnmower back and forth yep. style. Yep. So we'll stick with that personally in our shop. So I want to make an observation that you've done so far in this entire piece. Mm -hmm. You've kept Origin facing the same direction. Yes, I have. That's completely true. And again, this is one of our tips for ultimate cut quality for the most precision possible. Uh, you always want to scan and cut with Origin facing the same direction. And what that means is I've got Origin in front of me. This is maybe where I'm going to cut this imaginary feature on this sheet of plywood. I'm going to be holding Origin this direction when I cut. And so when I scan, I also want to be holding Origin this direction as I travel around the workspace. Um, can I, in theory, change Origin's direction and scan like this? Yes, you can. But we're talking about the ultimate imprecision here. And for the ultimate imprecision, you always want to keep Origin's camera and spindle oriented in the same direction. Just to be clear, that's ultimate in precision, not in precision. Yes, <laughs> ultimate in precision. Exactly. Uh, ultimate imprecision will be a different session where we teach you all of the worst ways the to do things. All the wrong things to do, yeah. Yeah. Um, 
I'm looking over at our whiteboard here. I think those are all the notes I think that so we too. had on scanning. Yeah. Um, again, if you have any questions on scans or you've run into something in your time with Origin, mm -hmm. please let us know in the comments. We would love to hear about it. We'll talk about it at the end of the show. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Uh, oh, uh, Goose is whispering in our ears, which uh, we asked you not to whisper during this show, Goose, but we did have a question on uh, whether or not you could pick Origin up to scan. Ah. And that's a great question. Yes. Uh, and that's one that we talked with Alec, our PhD computer scientist, about, not to brag. Um, but yes, you absolutely can pick up Origin to scan if you'd like. Um, let's see what that looks like. So if I go into scan, creating a new scan here, you can see that Origin's camera makes this uh, like trapezoidal shape. That's because it's looking down and forward. Um, so it has a wider field of view the farther out you go. You may notice if you're working with Origin uh, on something like Workstation, you might get some shadows, for example, when you're, uh, when you're taking uh, an image of something on Workstation shelf or of a tenant clamped to its front working face. One tip that I really like to eliminate those shadows is to move Origin's camera field of view perpendicular to your work plane. And what that actually means is lifting Origin up. You can see that as I lift Origin up, that image becomes square rather than trapezoidal. And so what that means is that you're looking straight down on whatever you're scanning. You're going to get an image of a tenon with less of a shadow than you normally would. That's also handy for if you want to pick up Origin and move it off the back of a workpiece, yes. for example, and you really want to scan this back edge. You can absolutely pick up Origin, move it back off the back, um, and as long as you've got tape in view, then the algorithm doesn't care. Yep. And like a situation like this where Russ hasn't scanned all the way down, or maybe mm -hmm. he would add a couple more strips of tape just so right. he could see more where he's working on, Origin can cut right here, even though he hasn't scanned this area in, because again, it's looking out ahead of itself. Personally, mm -hmm. that drives me bananas, because I want to be able to see the texture of the wood that I'm working on. Mm -hmm. So the, I always tend to put my tape not to, not to the bottom, because again, Origin sits right here, but like, I don't know, six inches from the bottom. That's kind of mm -hmm. where I put my last piece. Yeah. So One thing that we've been getting into here is uh, really framing the wood, and that's one of the most... Uh, Incredible, beautiful things that I think Origin is helpful for. If you have a template uh, that you're working on on a piece of hardwood, you can use the scan image and the outline of that cut file to really place that file to maximize the beauty of the grain of the wood. Yep. And the grain of the wood is one of the reasons that a lot of us are here exactly. today because there's just something about it. Uh, I hope that a lot of you can identify with that. And it's really cool to be able to just frame the wood as as you wanted. I see you looking up at the inlay. Yeah, there. It's I was really just thinking for inlays. Exactly. When you're looking at like the, you know, I wanted to get the grain orientation of the mountains here going that way and these mountains going that way. Mm -hmm. So to be able to see the grain yeah. pattern exactly. is huge. The vertical inlay, grain pattern of the cactus or of ship rock. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Ugh, it just makes me tear <laughs> up a little bit. It's so beautiful. Enough of that sappy stuff. <laughs> let's, uh, let's talk about gridding. Let's talk about gridding. Okay. Um, should we start off over here and hand it back for a center point grid? Yeah, we can start over there. Absolutely. Okay. I'm so, going to pass the mic. So, with gridding, oh, look at that workspace already seen. Beautiful. Just tap that green button, and I'm back to where I started. All right, with gridding, uh, for those of you that don't know, there are two ways to place a file or a cut file of any sorts with Origin. There's what I like to call visual placement, mm -hmm. which is just place it where you see on the screen. And that's pretty cool. That's pretty good. If you put a little X mark on your material, mm -hmm. scanned it, you'd see that little X mark, you could drop it down. That's pretty darn accurate. Mm -hmm. If you want it to be bang on, especially when you're doing things like hardware where you need to physically reference your material, mm -hmm. that's when we start making grids. Because we're physically probing off of that material with the bit. So we're creating a real-life grid attached to our stock. Mm -hmm. So I have already scanned in my workspace here. And we're looking at the top of the bench brush. And remind me, do you make a top-left grid on this project? Oh, that's a great question. 
I don't remember, honestly, off the top of my head. I think but I think left. we should do a top left grid because it's more interesting to illustrate. And I think I that is the most pro tip available yes. on gridding. Uh, I, have, I have certainly adapted to always making a top left or top right grid. And we'll kind of I'll explain what we're talking about when we say top versus bottom. Mm -hmm. um, anytime I use workstation, because it is the face that is pushed up against the clamp face, which mm -hmm. is not, it's not going to change. And it's the edge that's pressed up against the reference pins, which is also not going to change. Mm -hmm. So your material thickness and whatnot may ebb and flow, but mm -hmm. your workstation is not going anywhere. So yep. those are good faces to reference off of. So Exactly. I was Speaking like, of, I set this one up before the show. I didn't know that you were going to talk about the, uh, the left alignment feature. Uh, do we have one of those handy? We could alignment. reposition... Because we're just against the clamping face on this. Oh. We're not uh, aligned all the way to the left. Is it sitting over there, or should I go grab you one? Are you talking about the angle fence? The angle fence. Yep. It's right here. Perfect. Um, yeah, so the angle, of, for those of you that don't know, on the workstation, we have reference pins. If you want to hop down here, Goose, if you would, please. We have reference pins that screw out to give you a totally 90-degree reference, and you can also attach the angle fence to play with angles, but it also just establishes a longer, or taller, straight reference face. So this is really handy when you're doing things that aren't quite as tall as uh, a long tenon of sorts. But no, I don't think I need to use that yet. Okay. I'm going to make a grid. I'm going to make a top left grid. So in my design, f design category, hit grid, new. And it's gonna conveniently walk me through a couple steps. So notice I'm positioning I'm positioning myself on my workstation, so I'm hanging out over one of these uh, T slot holes in my workstation right here. I'm going to lower my bit right down into that little area. Hit set depth. Now, right off the bat, it is assuming I want to use the front of the bit, or rather the the edge farthest away from me of the bit and that's cool but i want to be able to change it because i want to use the back or the side that's closest to me so quickly and easily i can just hit the edge button right here and it switches what edge of the bit i'm using now i'm ever so slightly pulling back just a light contact not pressure because we're not trying to influence anything or press into the material just making contact tap that green button tilt my origin up and out of that hole so I don't bang my bit. Lower it carefully, carefully back in. And there's my second edge. And all right. You notice I'm between my point one and two right now, and it's giving me a center point grid. And as I come to the left, it automatically switches. Same thing is true if I come over to the right. It's just assuming where you want to be. But I'm going to come all the way over to this edge, lightly contact the side of my bit, and establish my Z axis. Beautiful. Cool. I think this would be the time to name that workspace. Absolutely. So this is a pro tip. We're jumping ahead of ourselves a little bit. But since we're all set up on this yeah. workspace, um, the point of gridding especially on workstation part of the point of it is that it's repeatable and you're able to come back and revisit that workspace um, but hopefully you work on a lot of projects uh, if you're like us you have hundreds of workspaces saved on origin because it remembers every unique setup that you've ever made uh, and so it's really helpful to be able to save those and save them for later yeah um, and that's definitely the benefit of using your reference pins and your you know, to mm -hmm. make things repeatable in that sense but real easy to change the name of your workspace. I'm in my scan. I've already scanned everything in. And the screen that shows up here, I can either hit the workspaces tab or just right here where it says workspace 143. Bingo. And this is bench brush. Bench brush. Bingo. And now I, that will be there. I can search for it too. 
if months down the road I want to make this thing over again and I don't want to have to regrid or scan, mm -hmm. I can search for the bench brush workspace and yeah, everything that's on here, everything that we've ever done on sessions. Mm -hmm. You're really looking out for future Jake there. Exactly. By naming your workspaces. Yeah. If I'm doing uh, the same tenon, but the tenon on one side and the tenon on the other, I have a right tenon where I'm cutting it on the, I'm sorry, left tenon on the left side of the workstation. I will flip the whole thing and set it up on the right side of the workstation. So mm -hmm. I have two workspaces, left tenon, right tenon. And even though it's the same piece of wood, I'm just keeping yeah. all my reference faces consistent. And it's so easy to jump back and forth. Yeah, we talked about that one on the T-Rack. Um, if you haven't noticed, we have on sessions.shapertools.com a whole backlog of on-demand sessions that you can view with uh, more details. We're kind of glossing over all these pro tips. Uh, but if you want to really think about how to set up tenants, we've got a session on that. If you want a session on cutters in great depth, we've got a session on that. Go check out those on-demand sessions. And one where we talked about tenants recently was making Phil Morley's T-Rack, our latest premium project. Thanks. So definitely check that out if you're interested in tenants. Yeah. OK, we made a, a well slightly more advanced and standard grid. Um, but there's another grid that's really cool. It's called the center point grid. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to swap out the bit, but I can't find a T-wrench. Hmm. Do you okay. have one handy over there? Well, I've got a cutter over here. Um, and no, you know, honestly, I don't have a T-wrench over here because we didn't think that we were going to cut anything, which we aren't. So uh, this is how you all know that we're doing it live. Jake's going to go step off set here and grab a T-handle. Um, as he's doing that, I'm going to bring you over here to talk about our next setup. Um, this is going to illustrate a different method of gridding. And to do that, I am going to make a new scan in the, whoop, I'm going to start again. So one thing that just popped up that I want you to know about is that you do want all of your tape to be on just one plane. Yeah. So I'm going to try very carefully to scan just this workspace without scanning the tape that's below it. We could flip the board too. We so. could flip the board if we have to, but I think, I think I can get enough tape in this one to make it happen. So we're going to get this row of tape back here. We're going to go all the way back down. Oop. Here we go. Oop. Lost it. Let's come back up and around. So uh, Jake, could you tell the folks about um, planarity of tape? And I have to add a little bit more to this one. Yeah. I mean, I mean so when you're cutting with Origin, it is really important that your tape is on the same plane that you're cutting. So this is kind of the exact example of what not to do. You don't want to be cutting up here and see tape down here. Um, so part of the reason why we created the shelf for workstation, and it makes doing odd thickness things really easy because you can bring it up flush with the top of your tape surface. Alternatively, you can make things like tape boards, which is if you have a piece of inch thick stock, you get some plywood or MDF that's also an inch, inch thick, and you're butting those two things up together. So you have one where you're putting your shaper tape and the other where you're creating or where you're putting your stock, for example. Something like this. So we're cutting a half inch stock. We have a nice little tape board section where we just butt our stock up here, press it up over here. This is actually for the nesting trays. Oh, there you uh, go. Michael Alm's nesting trays project. Uh, and everything's nice and flush. So as you're scooting origin across the top, you don't feel any bumps or anything. Mm -hmm. OK, I've successfully scanned. And that's the nice thing. You can just add a little bit more tape. You can err on the side of less tape if you're, if you're worrying about using too much tape. Um, and you can see up here, my tape health meter is flickering right now. But if I move it, oh, there's got to be somewhere on here where it's a full tape meter. Maybe not. Maybe I would uh, potentially even add another row right up here to really full that out. Yep. But uh, that's what you want to be paying attention to right there is that tape meter. It tells you how, how well you're doing on tape and how well the computer is recognizing where you are. You want that to be full. But this is good enough to illustrate the center line grid. So if I create a new grid here, did we swap this cutter out? Let's swap this cutter out first. And I want to use the engraving cutter. We're using the engraving cutter like kind of like a stylus. So we're using it partially mm -hmm. as a probe and partially as a sharp stylus for that last point. Mm -hmm. 
Exactly. This is the kind of thing that's great for, I mean, this application, but also really large applications. So if you're doing things like flooring, but you still want to be able to reference a grid, mm -hmm. you can use that engraving bit, make some marks on your, on your floor, and line the point of that engraving bit right up to your pencil line. Mm -hmm. Or center of a conference table, if you, wanna, if you wanted to cut something uh, like a cord recess or something out of the center of a conference table, you don't have to cover the entire table in shaper tape. You could just do the section that you're actually going to cut, make some real life markings on the table, and create a grid based off of that. I do still need to add a scan here. I was really cutting it close on this one. i um, going to cancel this, go back into scan, and adding to scan is quite easy. I just press this add to scan button when I can see tape, um, start that scan, and all the new tape that I added is now visible. Perfect. So now when I come back here and I'm ready to grid, now we can see the edge and it's not telling me that I don't have enough tape. So I'm going to come in here, grid, create a new grid, lower this cutter all the way for the first part of my grid, which is defining that x-axis, two points spaced nice and far apart. And you can see now oh, I'm once again running right into my area of low tape. Let's see what happens if I raise the cutter. So the next step of this is to raise the cutter, move above your line, I'm going to remove this dust guard here so that I can see into uh, see into what's going on here. And then lower the cutter slowly and manually so that it's just grazing or like just above the surface. Yeah. Right, Jake? Just above my work surface. And you can do that at any time when you're gritting by just pressing this depth button here. You set the depth when you start your grid. But if at any time during the grid you need to change it, you just hit depth and you can raise and lower. And now this is nice that my image matches where um, my cutter is physically lined up, where I've seen um, below the spindle on my workspace. But you really do want to go off of what you see with your eyes because while Origin is very accurate on its own, there can be a little bit of camera distortion. And you really want to, whenever possible, if you're gridding, really align something physical on origin, in this case, the tip of that engraving bit, with something physical on your work. And in this case, that's that square pencil mark, yep. right where I want it in the center. So I'm nice and aligned. I'm going to hit probe three, and I'm all set. And now you can see my grid is square to the bottom and square with that line right in the middle. You can also see that it's square on this little feature in the foam, which is another good sign. And so I would be ready to cut my Sys1 Sustainer custom foam insert. Which you can set. find on Shaper Hub. Which you can find on Shaper Hub. Um, especially neat for anyone who participated in our spring deal that we just had recently. Exactly. Anyone who's watching this who has an origin coming, you're going to get your Sys1 with that if you participated in our spring deal. Um, and this is a great first project to get you started off. Yeah. Super easy to cut. Mm -hmm. uh, Make yourself a custom custom toolbox. Yeah, uh, what I'm going to do, <laughs> I haven't even done a, I can't believe I haven't done a Sys1 yet, but I just finished this uh, beautiful handmade wooden block plane and hammer, and I'm going to make a Sys1 that is just like that, just a block plane and hammer. Better move Origin out of the way so everybody can see how beautiful that's going to be. I'll show that off in a week or two when it's done. For, for all the times that you need to travel long and far <laughs> with your block with plane. My, <laughs> with my block plane and adjusting hammer. Yeah, exactly. I'm just uh, proud of it. Proud of it to a fault, you might even say. You know what's fun, too? You have that You have that, um, that bracket on the back of your motorcycle to mount a sustainer. Yeah, so it could exactly. just be a little trunk for a block, block plane. Yeah, exactly. Perfect. Um, let's see. So we've taped, scanned, and gridded. Yep. If you have any questions on those, please drop, in the, drop them in the comments. Please answer our poll to be entered in the giveaway that we're going to run during Q&A at the end of the show. Um, but if we were to cut this project for real with Origin, the next step 
would be to Z-Touch. Yep. Z-Touch, anytime that you're changing a bit, anytime, that, really, anytime you touch the spindle, anytime you take it out of origin, re-Z-Touch, uh, mm -hmm. especially if you change the bit. That way you are establishing where the bit is in relationship to the bottom of origin or the top of your material. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really important because we want to know that our depth is accurate. When we say go down a quarter inch, we want to know that that is, in fact, cutting a quarter inch deep. Yep. Not always an easy task mm -hmm. because materials vary from super hard hardwoods to soft foam. Um, mm -hmm. So there, we have a couple of tricks to make sure that you get a really solid Z-touch. And once you know this, you'll you'll never wonder. Yeah, you'll never wonder you'll never again. Never wonder again. For starters, I don't think that we've ever explained start to finish on a shape recession how Z Touch actually works. I don't think we have. And I think that's crucial for understanding how to use Z Touch to its fullest capabilities. So I'm going to show you something that we don't usually show on shape recessions, which is the bottom. <gasps> of origin. <laughs> um, what's the best camera to show this off on? I think maybe the bench cam is going to be good. Let's see. Can you see that, Goose? Huh? Oh, here we go. Little. There we go. A little bench cam adjustment. Um, this is going to be tricky. Jake, I think you're going to have to point this one out. Where is the touch bar on this puppy? Right here. Okay. I hope you all can see that on the camera. At the bottom of origin, in that thin part below the spindle, is a slightly raised bar. Now, don't worry, when you're cutting, that raised bar is no longer raised. When your origin is sitting flat on a work surface, that raised bar is actually also flat with your work surface. But it does something really important when you're Z-touching. What's that? Well, as you Z-touch, you may notice that the spindle comes down, at a certain point, the tip of your cutter is going to contact your work surface. And you may not even notice, you shouldn't notice if your Z-Touch is like primo, spot on. But Origin actually lifts a minute, tiny, imperceptible amount when the spindle is traveling downward and the tip of the cutter contacts your workpiece. What the touch bar recognizes is, oh, Origin's lifting up just a little bit. I must be contacting a workpiece, and it happens in an instant. And that registers your Z0. Yep. Now, I love it. there are a couple things that make that really difficult. If you have an engraving cutter, which is finely pointed on something like the Sys1 foam, it might actually take a little bit extra Z travel to be able to generate the amount of force to lift Origin up. And if anyone's cut a really soft material like styrofoam or modeling foam or the Sys1 sustainer foam, or maybe something like balsa, a really yeah, soft wood. even soft woods. Or mm -hmm. this, um, it's, yeah. it's possible to run into this situation. Um, but there are a lot of things that you can do that we're going to teach you to make your Z-Touch work as well as possible to get the best Z-Touch every time. The number one best tip is to always Z-Touch on a firm work surface. Yeah, so it's you don't necessarily need to Z-touch off of the material that you're cutting. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes I do, um, especially in workstation. But for a situation like this, mm -hmm. Z-touch off on the piece of MDF that's MDF that's right next to it. Right, exactly. You're gonna get the same, like a nice solid contact. Mm -hmm. um, and again, you're trying to register where that the end of that bit is to the bottom of origin. Right, exactly. Z-touch registers the location of the end of the cutter to the bottom of origin relative to the bottom of origin. And then when you move origin somewhere else, it keeps that relationship to the bottom of origin, not to the thing that you Z-touched off of. Right. For example. Uh, Want to do an example of what a bad Z-touch looks like when you have the front end of origin hanging off the edge? Yeah, absolutely. This is another tip. Uh, if you ever have a Z-touch where that touch bar is outright not contacting your workpiece or a solid support, uh, it needs the registration of the touch bar on something physical to register when it's not touching that physical thing anymore. So if it isn't touching anything in the first place, it's never going to notice when origin starts to lift because it's not touch it's going from not touching something to still not touching anything. Yeah. In which no case, it'll just keep going down until it goes, all right, this isn't going to work. Yeah, let's show the people. You want to set it up on workstation there? Go ahead and do it. Right there. Yeah, right, we'll do it right edge. here. Okay, so now I'm officially off the edge. Perfect. I'm going to go into cut where Z-touch is. Um, and 
I think, Goose, let's do this on the, the main camera because it's going to be hard to see when we're in origin cam. So I'm going to go to Z-Touch, and you're going to see Origin tip forward as the, as the spindle continues down. So the spindle is traveling down now, and Origin's about to tip forward. Oop, there we go. Um, that didn't travel very far because the engraving cutter is pretty short, so we're at the end of the Z-Touch range, yeah. but we get an error here that says Z-Touch failed. Make sure Origin's base is on a single uniform surface and try again. You know what would be a good place to do this? Hmm. Let's do it on workstation with the workstation cam okay. engaged. I think that'll really show what's going on. I'll pass this over. And let's put this quarter inch cutter back in there so it's nice and long. So we get some good travel. Mm -hmm. Another important note, when you are Z-touching, don't forget to tighten your spindle. <laughs> That's a big one. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and uh, many a time, my butt has been saved when I've gone to Z-Touch, and I have then noticed that my spindle clamp is not tight. Um, a surprising pro tip is to always clamp your spindle collar, um, because even Jake and I forget sometimes, oh, yeah. and it's important. Absolutely. <laughs> all right. So we got it all locked back in here. Okay. Return to that workspace. Workspace bench, bench brush. All right. So same deal. I'm gonna get rid of this. And bring that up a tad. All right. My, you hop over to the workstation cam. This is not contacting. I'm gonna touch off on my material. It's just kind of hovering. This is like hanging off the edge of your workspace. Nope, Z-Touch failed. So, for one, this is not level, but this is the, one of the big reasons why Workstation has a support bar. Mm -hmm. This thing is supposed to back up your origin. It's supposed to give you a little extra room to ride on, but also when you're cutting a tenon, you want to sneak this up to the tenon, not directly against it, but close enough, so that when you Z-Touch directly off the top of that material, because I always like to um, touch off on the top of my tenon if I'm cutting a leg or anything like that, mm -hmm. specifically in workstation. When we're doing flat work and stuff, I'm okay with Z-Touching on whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but when it's in workstation, just to make sure that I know exactly how deep my tenon is going to be, I make sure that I Z-Touch off of that. And I use this as the area that my touch-off bar is resting on. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Speaking of touching off on material, we've got another great yes. example here to show you of the of an example of a time where you might want to touch off inside of a pocket. Um, we use a lot of fixtures here. Fixtures are a great way to make repeatable work, uh, to make work that you can flip and work on one side and then the other side uh, exactly repeatably. And the fixture that we brought over today is from our Bench Brush Premium Project with Aspen Golan. Um, You'll find that if you are making fixtures out of plywood for hardwood parts, it's very rare that uh, the thickness of the plywood is exactly what you want for the thickness of the hardwood part yeah. uh, because plywood only comes in certain thicknesses. So in this situation, we made our fixture thicker than the hardwood part, but we want to make the cuts relative to the top surface of the hardwood, not the top surface of the plywood. So Jake's going to show us what it's like to touch off on the top of the workpiece, not just the fixture or workstation. Yeah, if you hop down to the workstation cam goose, you might be able to see this is just ever so slightly th lower than my fixture. So same deal, just pull my origin and make sure that I'm right over the walnut. I want to make sure that my touch-off bar has a nice solid place to sit. That feels good right there. And Z touch. Bingo. Beautiful. All right. So we've Z touched. Um, and I think now we're ready to cut. Or I cut so. in theory. Yes. Right. Exactly. We know exactly where zero is. Our grid is set up. Repeatability is, is on our side. Mm -hmm. We're good to go. Perfect. Um, I don't think we are going to cut anything real for this show, but we do have some air cut examples to show off. Yeah, there's a lot. Of, I mean, we've talked about everything but cutting so far, and cutting is what you do most of the tools. So mm -hmm. we have a couple of tips there. 
Mm -hmm. um, that will make your life a little easier in specifically corners. Mm -hmm. Because corners with anything can be tricky. Um, And with a router spinning really fast, it goes from having part of the bit engaged to a lot of the bit engaged when you are going into a tight corner or even a 90 degree corner. Yeah. So there's a couple of ways to navigate that. You want to, you want to take it back? Yeah, I'll take it back. Let's set this up over here and I'm going to switch to this workspace. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to design a quick rectangle. Let's make it three inches wide and three inches tall. I just want some corners to show you all. And I'm just going to place it any old place. Right there is fine. Um, if I go into cut, we're going to do an air cut. Um, let's do an inside cut. Let's imagine that we're doing a mortise, for example. Now, there are a couple different ways that you can approach this cut by moving origin relative to the cut path that you want to do. Um, the trick that ties all of these things together is that origin defaults to taking the shortest path between where it is and where it thinks it should be. That's that corrective action that it does in real time for you. And there are a couple different ways that you can use this to your advantage. Um, If you wanted to move quickly and cut around a corner, you could move on the inside of that corner and origin will automatically go around the corner for you because at a certain point, the other side of the corner is going to be closer to you than the first side of the corner. The corollary to that is that if you want ultimate control and you want to pause in that corner, and this is what I like to do a lot of the time, I try to move on the outside of the corner because when you do that, the closest point to you is never going to be beyond where you are you're likely to have the closest point be the corner itself. So we'll show you both of those. Um, let's do a quick demo here, just to, just to see how it works. I'm gonna change all this to zero offset. We've got a quarter inch imaginary cutter. We've got an air cut, not even gonna turn the spindle on. Now I'm gonna start here and I'm gonna show you what happens when I move around the inside of the corner. And this can be better for if you wanna work quickly, for example. So I'm gonna move down here into cut. I'm on the inside of that corner. And as I approach the corner, pretty soon it's going to move around on its own. See, I'm not moving origin at all. You're also not holding auto. I'm not holding auto. That's correct. That's an important distinction, and we'll get to that in a second. Let's do another one that way. I am coming up on the inside of the corner, and at a certain point, there we go. It's just taking itself around. So that's what happens when you work on the inside of the corner. I'm oh, you're still that. Z-touched. <laughs> I was trying to figure out what was going on. Oh, no, I'm Z-touched off of something else. You're, yeah, off of this. Off of the pocket, exactly. That's why you <laughs> always Z-touch. Um, let's, let's give it a quick one here. Z-touch. Yeah, I was dragging there a little bit. That's a good Z-touch. Perfect. Um, let's see. Where was my rectangle? Here we go. So now let's see how that behaves, uh, how origin behaves when I move on the outside of the corner. This is something that I prefer to do most of the time. I feel like it gives me a little bit more control. Yeah. So I'm still air cutting. Now I'm moving around the outside of the corner and you can see origin's not jumping ahead of me at all. In fact, it pauses in that corner a little bit and waits for me to get around to the other side. And again, if I continue up here, I'm gonna get to that corner It's going to pause and wait for me to carry it with me through the other side. Really cool distinction there and something that I forgot to do the other day on Instagram Live. And I was an inch and an eighth deep in white oak cutting a mortise in a corner. Uh, And you feel it because that's a lot of material. It's a lot Mm -hmm. of hard oak to hit all of a sudden with Mm -hmm. that much cutter. Mm -hmm. Um, So had I led with the let on the outside of the on the square, I mm-hmm. would have had a much smoother operation. Mm-hmm. The other thing that you can do is um, use auto to your advantage. So rather yeah. than moving on the inside of the corner and letting origin take over when it wants to take over, you can induce origin to move automatically. Uh, so it's more like the two of you working together by pressing the green button while you're cutting and using auto mode. Um, and that way you both expect Yep. what's going to happen at the right time. So let's show the same rectangle 
in auto mode. And to illustrate this, I'm going to use the outside of the corner again, um, but just let Origin drive all the way through. So I'm going to hit the green button to cut. And you can see here that auto is down here on the right hand side. And that means that whenever I press that green button, it's Origin's going to feed automatically. And it's my job to keep up with it. Now, I really like using auto mode in the corners because Origin, a lot of the time, has better control than the user itself in corners, uh, especially for small things like marquetry. Mm -hmm. If you're doing this uh, ship rock inlay, a lot of time on auto because it very smoothly takes out all those jitters. So let's go back to the screen here and take auto around the corner. So I'm getting close, and I'm just going to hit auto, and Origin moves nice and smoothly around that corner. And I'm going to bring it up to the next corner, and I'm going to hit auto, and it takes it nice and smoothly around that corner, and it's my job to keep up. I like it too because depending on what you're cutting, that gives you an opportunity to kind of brace for it. Mm -hmm. Because again, cutting corners, you're suddenly uh, introducing a lot more material around the bit the second yeah. you get into that corner. So if you can tighten your grip a little bit on origin, maybe put a little bit more down pressure, hold mm -hmm. auto, and allow it to mm -hmm. move its way around, that's mm -hmm. how you're going to get nice clean corners. Mm -hmm. One final corner tip that we have for you is the creation of dog bones. Um, this is more for plywood joinery, uh, flat pack type stuff than a lot of the hardwood joinery that we do here, but it's still useful. You might be able to see on origin screen, the light blue is my cut path here. The gray is my intended rectangle, and you can see that there's a small gap right there between what I wanted to remove, which is that entire rectangle, and the blue that I actually cut. So one way that we can go in and fix that is by using offsets and by using that neat property of corners where if I stay on the outside of the corner, origin stays right in one place. So I've used a negative offset of 0 0.05 for this corner, and you can see that the, uh, the darker gray shadow there that represents what I'm going to cut if I plunge on this cut path actually now encompasses that corner space. If I just press the green button to cut and then stay there, simply quickly retract, you can see now that I've got a little bit of extra cut. We call that a dog bone, and that takes you all the way out and around that corner. That's really useful for fixtures. I make a lot of fixtures in plywood, but a lot of the time I put things with 90 degree corners in them. For example, this bench brush. Yeah. Um, and you need to remove a little bit of extra material in that corner so that your part can sit all the way in the fixture as you intended. Yep. And that's a nice clean dog bone. It's really subtle. Um, I like that. Just keep in mind when you plunge, Origin is going to plunge at the closest location. Mm -hmm. So you got to think about where you position before you plunge. In this mm -hmm. case, uh, on the corner or slightly away from the corner, right. on the outside of right. the corner, and then it will move to be in the perfect position. Yep, exactly. This is how that's related to that outside the corner cutting tip. Um, anything else that people should know about cutting? Feeds and speeds. Feeds and speeds. Uh, I know there's a lot of conversations around feeds and speeds, and origin is a tricky one in the sense of your feed speed is, well, it's you. You're feeding mm -hmm. it. So um, the only time that that changes is your auto speed, which you can adjust um, on the speed setting. Yeah, let's show that real quick. We've got the default here right now. Yes, and typically that's where I leave it, and we'll talk about a couple instances where we want to adjust that. For your auto speed, if you're doing something like helical hole boring or engraving and you have a ton of text, I may bump that up a little bit. Not too crazy. Um, but if I'm trying to work through something a little faster, I'll take my auto speed to mm -hmm. 15 so that it's engraving those letters a little quickly. Or it is traveling around the inside of that hole, whether it be mm -hmm. a hole pattern like on the top of the MFT or whatever. It's doing mm -hmm. that a little bit faster, and mm -hmm. there's kind of a you know a healthy balance of of a, a learned balance I should say of what feels right, what gives you the best result. Um, but it's nice that you can change that. Yep, you absolutely can. Um, I find that I change that the most when I'm cutting light cuts. 
Yes. I'm, yeah. I'm happy to let the machine take over and move a lot faster when it's taking a light cut. Yeah. And then for plunging, same thing. That Plunging is uh, the speed at which from zero into your material. Mm-hmm. How fast are you doing that? So mm-hmm. um, if you're doing something really dense, I like to back that plunge speed down. If I'm doing super dense plastics or uh, like a resin composite kind of stuff mm-hmm. or non-ferrous metals, I'm going to dial that back so that I'm not ramming a, uh, a flat-bottomed bit into a hard surface like that. Mm-hmm. You can ease it in. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's nice to be able to do too. Speaking of dialing it back, the third speed, <laughs> we've got the plunge speed, we've got the auto speed, and the third speed that we talk a lot about is the spindle speed. My biggest pro tip for that is take it easy. Um, it goes up to six. We've got speeds one to six. We never use six. No. We never use six. I used to use six, and then I was burning through cutters a lot. <laughs> Yeah, I'm just you know there are, there are applications for six. Um, mm-hmm. I can't think of one. If you are just cruising through material, if you're moving very quickly, right? Because mm-hmm. otherwise you're you're traveling too slow for the amount of friction that you're building up at that mm-hmm. high of an RPM. Yeah, um, and that's going to dull your cutters. It's going to burn your materials. It's mm-hmm. just you're not going to get the best kind of cut quality out of that. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. I always tell people start at four when you're first starting out with Origin. Four is a good speed for your kind of quarter inch cutter plywood hardwoods kind of realm um, and as you start getting more confident with origin and you're moving a little faster with it, bump it up to five. see yep. how that feels see how it goes and if you start toasting bits or toasting wood, dial then turn it, it back. back or melting plastic <laughs> there you dial go. it back and that that a big reason why we have such a wide range of rpm is because mm-hmm. This spindle goes a lot lower than your normal spindle that you can find on the market so that you can mm-hmm. cut things that would melt like plastics. Yeah, exactly. Thanks, everyone. Have a great evening. Thank you. We'll see you next time. Bye.